I thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, I know I see a lot of folks who I get to see once a month, and and it's good to see you come back. But I know there are some new parents, parents who are here for the first time tonight. So welcome. Um, between jo Carolyn and John uh, leading the Sped Pack and my being here, um, we try to make it possible for uh, you to have the opportunity to hear some things that are going on and also have the opportunity to uh, make sure that we learn about your uh, concerns. If you have con specific concerns, the main way to do that, as Carolyn said, is fill out one of the, the con concern forms and those come directly to me and then I get members of my staff to work on the issues over the next few days. Uh, sometimes parents have a need to see me uh, before the meeting and so I've had the opportunity over the last half hour to talk to lots of individual parents and I want to thank those parents for talking to me. Uh, particularly, I want to say parents who have to share with me something that makes, you very, makes the parent very uncomfortable, something that's gone wrong in school or a place where my department has failed. Um, sometimes it's uncomfortable to tell me that. That's why I'm here. So don't be uncomfortable about that if you can manage it. Just take the opportunity to tell me about what we haven't done well, and I'll try to change that if I can. Um, I, uh, I also want to make, make it clear that when I'm here for the first part of the meeting every month, I'll share with you some things that are going on, and I'll take some time to hear directly from you in the large group. So if there's something you want to share that is not about your particular child, but about the school or the school district or the city that you want me to know about, positive or negative, um, it's a good time to say that out loud so everybody gets to hear it. If it's not about your own individual child, that's sometimes a good thing because something you're experiencing, positive or negative, maybe something that other parents are experiencing and it's a good thing to put it out on the table. I want to acknowledge the parents who two years ago were sitting in these same seats and raised big problems for me, brought up big problems, and we worked on it and we resolved some problems and here you are still coming back and and some of you have taken the opportunity to tell me that something's going well for your child. That's, that's a nice thing for me to hear. I appreciate that. Um, I share that with my staff when I hear about that. Uh, we have 56,000 students in the Boston Public Schools. 11,000 of those students are students with disabilities. So about a little under 20% of our students are uh, students with disabilities. Um, you can imagine that um, trying to work closely with you on behalf of your individual children at the same time that I'm working on behalf of 11,000 kids uh, sometimes is overwhelming for me. Um, I have a lot of new administrators in my offices who are great. Um, there's a whole new generation of leadership in special ed, and uh, you'll, you'll over time meet more and more of those people at these meetings. So one of our administrators is here tonight, Lorraine. Um, Lorraine is one of our program directors for uh, services for children on the autism spectrum. She's called the program director. Um, she supervises a lot of the people, she and her colleagues supervise a lot of the people who are actually delivering direct services to children on the autism spectrum. She's located at K-12 
Campbell Resource Center on Dorchester Avenue when she's actually sitting in a chair. She's usually on her feet out in the schools, in classrooms, meeting students, uh, working with people in the schools. Um, so if anybody wants to talk to a member of our autism leadership group, Lorraine's here tonight. I hope that's okay. I didn't ask you if I could do that before. Okay. Um, I'll, I'm going to be inviting the leadership people of my staff to come to these meetings. Not all of them at once because there are a lot of them, but a few of them each month going into the next couple of years so you get to know who they are. Um, I, I did want to share uh, something that, that John St. Amand and Carolyn Kane and I uh, received last night just before the school committee meeting. Um, last night at the school committee, the school committee approved the budget for the Boston Public Schools for next year. And um, thanks to the work of our chief financial officer, John McDonough, um, our budget is um, all done for next year. Uh, it's in very good shape. A uh, couple of things I want to share with you. We are last year. We are the, we were the only department of the city. The school department was the only department of the city whose budget was not cut. That's the, the budget we're living with right now. All the other departments of the city were cut. This year, we're the only department of the city receiving an increase. So our budget actually, from this year to next year, will go up. And that's thanks to the leadership of the city, the mayor, the city council, um, where there's a substantial commitment, a big commitment, to education. Um, Frankly, I, I wouldn't want to work anywhere else right now. Um, I don't want to be the head of special education in any other city that I know of because not only is the budget for the school district going up, but the budget for special education is going up. So I thought I'd show you a graph that we were shown last night, which is um, this. I, I, I don't have copies for everybody. I'm sorry about that, but um, this is a bar graph showing the increases in the number of staff allocated to each one of the departments of the Boston Public Schools. So we're increasing the number of people working in our departments, not in my offices, but in the whole department, across the school district by about 200 people. So thanks to the city's increased allocation to the schools, the schools are hiring 200 more people than we have this year, and most of them are direct service people delivering direct services to children. In fact, there is no increase in my administrative staff. So the increase in special ed is all people delivering services to kids. This bar in the middle, that's special education. Okay, so this bar over here, first one, is general education. Next one is English language learners. Special education, student support for in general education, physical plant, that's facilities, and all others. Can I say that that deserves some applause? It, it does. <laughs> I can't take credit for it, I have to tell you. Um, John McDonough should be, is the one who, who should be given credit. So if you have any opportunity, and Dr. Johnson, if you have any opportunity to meet John McDonough, the Chief Financial Officer, and or Dr. Johnson, be sure to acknowledge, or if you think of it, acknowledge the fact that this school district has decided not only to do better, but to do more um, for our children with disabilities. So this is one of the reasons why I don't want to work anywhere else. Uh, question. What makes up the increases? Yeah, Here, uh, direct service people, and I'll mention the ones that I know of off the top of my head. because I doesn't have teachers. 
Oh, administrative teachers? No, this is not administrative. There's, these are direct service providers, teachers, uh, related service providers, ABA providers, uh, um, nurses. Uh, I think that probably captures most of them. Uh, I'll try to get, as I get more. It would be good if you broke it up. I will. As to what makes this increase, because I'm sure for the city to come up with something, you had to identify for them to pick the people that you need. Oh, yeah, I spend a lot of time asking for things. Um, but it, and and it, once a year, we get to find out whether we're going to be able to do any more. And so we've just found out that we are going to be able to do more of that next year than we're doing this year. So that's, I think, a, a really significant thing that's going to make uh, doing better easier. It's not always better to spend more money. It's more than just spending more money. It's getting the right people to do the right work is very important. Now I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes telling you the things that we're working on accomplishing this year with the budget we have this year. First of all, we've increased the number of schools in the Inclusive Schools Network from four schools two years ago to 12 schools last year to 20 schools going into next year. Now, I want to be clear, not all these schools are fully inclusive. These are schools that have joined the network, getting special technical assistance and support to increase the amount of inclusion that's available in those schools. It'll take us 10 years to be able to say that all of our schools are fully inclusive. So we're in year two. Um, we got a ways to go. Next, we've increased our capacity for early childhood special education by already 23 new classrooms during the year, and we will have another probably five new classrooms between now and the end of the year. All three and four year olds who need special education placements get those placements immediately. So there's no young children anymore waiting for placements. Um, and we're going to continue to stay just a little bit ahead of the demand. So right now we have a few seats available across the city. We're going to open two new classes in two weeks. And we'll open a couple of more classes in a month or so if we need to. It's very important for you to know that the number of young children, three and four year olds, has, has, is going to increase by the end of the year by 50% in one year. So the number of children who were in seats at the end of last year is 550. We already have close to 750 in seats and we'll have close to 800 before the end of the year. That's a huge increase in one year. And it has to do with better programming in the early intervention years, zero to three, in this city, better advocacy for children and families, uh, better information to families about what they have a right to and what we offer, um, and more classes. So it's a little bit of the, the field of dreams experience where if you build it, they will come. And uh, that's very exciting for us because if that's true, that if we have classes available in your neighborhood or your school, you'll send your kids, we're going to keep opening classes um, because we want three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds to be going to school. Um, so. Um, that's the second one. We, we did, in that process, reopen a closed school and set up the first early childhood center in the city in the Fifield building in Dorchester. Um, so we have integrated classes there, classes for children on the autism spectrum, and non-categorical, substantially separate classes there. Um, we have created, this year was, was our 
first full year of implementation of the highly specialized strands at the K to 8 level. And we're trying now to uh, support the development of those strands. So we're, we focused a lot of our time and energy on the development of the strands. And so if you have a child who's in a substantially separate setting between kindergarten and eighth grade, your child is attending a school with a strand in it. And a strand means if your child is attending that school, they can stay at that school until the end of that grade span. So if all other kids stay there until eighth grade, your child can stay there until eighth grade. We, you don't have to move around. It's done a, something that I didn't anticipate, which I find exciting. Um, I met with a family today. I, I don't see them here tonight, so they may, may not have made it tonight where the student is attending a strand in one school for children on the autism spectrum and the particular situation in that school isn't very good for that student. So we're talking about what the other strands are in their zone so that the parents can have some choices about where their student might go to school for the rest of this year or September. Um, it's an easy thing for me to do because I know that in that zone of the city there are three strands at the K-8 to level for children on the autism spectrum. So if it's not working out for a child in one school, they don't have to stay there. Um, sometimes, as you know, for your own children, what's critical is the match between your child and the school, or the match between your child and the program he's in. It's not, technically speaking, it's a fine placement but it's not working for your child. When that happens, we want to know about it. Um, we've reconfigured the role of the evaluation team facilitator and changed it to so, uh, special education and student service coordinator in the schools. That's a half done change at this point. We've, we've changed a lot of the people in those positions and changed the job description, but because we're in a rather contentious labor relations environment right now that you've probably heard about um, with the negotiations over the contract. Um, we're not getting all the change that we want to get from that switch and so we'll, we'll continue to work on it. One thing I would say if there's a coordinator in your school who's doing a great job working with you, uh, I'd like to know about it. So. I do hear it when it's not going well, <laughs> um, and you got to keep doing that. But if it's going well, if there's a really good coordinator in your school and it's going well, please call Patty, my administrative assistant, and let her know that. That's important to us. Um, I was told by, this by the way, what I'm reading was written by the chief financial office in the Boston Public Schools. I didn't write this. So what this means is that the chief financial officer knows all the changes that are going on in special education. And it's one of the reasons why our budget is going up, because they understand what we're doing. They know where to invest the dollars. And so they wrote a very interesting thing here. Change the language from letters and numbers to disability types and levels of severity. So that the Chief Financial Office now has learned the new language of special education. I know, I'll bet, that some of your students are still described by a letter and a number. Anybody in the room can tell me what letter and number is attached to your child? I, I, I too. Okay, an I too student. That's a student who's in a fully inclusive setting. I, for inclusion. The two actually is meaningless. Doesn't mean anything at all. I don't know where it came from. That's the old system. Any other letter or number combination that anybody's aware of? What is it? U4. A U4. U4. That's a student with a language-based learning disability who's in a substantially separate class. We don't refer to those students, we in our offices, and increasingly the other offices 
of the Boston Public Schools. Don't refer to those students as U fours anymore. Any other? What was it? F four. Okay, that's that's a student with intellectual impairment who's in a substantially separate class. Now, you can see there's no relationship between F and that student, <laughs> or U, the letter U, and that student. So we've proposed a new way of describing students, and it's, for, it's called the Students First Movement. So now, um, I'm trying to see if I could pick somebody up. Okay, so a student who has autism and is in a inclusive setting would be a student with autism in an inclusive setting. So, so rather than call them by a letter and a number, we describe who the student is. It's called the student's first movement. When I arrived in Boston two years ago, we called that student, well, let's say a student with autism in a substantially separate setting would be an X4. I was struck by the fact that we called our students with autism X's. I couldn't figure that one out. I didn't know where the X came from. And I thought it might be a little bit insulting if the student knew that we called them an X. Right? I, I, so we're really trying to move away from describing students by letters and numbers. And the chief financial officer now doesn't know what an X4 is. He knows that there are students with autism in substantially separate classes, which is a lot more helpful to him because he now knows that these students have autism and they're in substantially separate classes. Okay. Another thing, we've increased the number of sites for the extended school year program and we increased it again this year. So we went to a larger number of sites last summer and we're going to a larger number of sites this year. And by the way, last month I let you know that I think we pre passed out a table of where all the sites are and I let you know that that was our final proposal. It is now a confirmed, approved. Those are all the sites for ESY and you will be hearing very quickly from your schools and evaluation teams about planning for the summer if that isn't already done. Um, We've increased the number of one-on-one -on -one paras. Does, does anybody in the room have a child who has a one-on-one -on -one para? Paraprofessional? I do. One, two. Okay, so there are 120 one-on-one -on -one paras working with students in the district. Now we have 11,000 students with disabilities 120 of them have a one-on-one -on -one pair because they need a one-on-one -on -one pair to be successful in school. It's a very highly specialized service. A year ago, we had 90 one-on-one -on -one pairs. We now have 120. Um, that number 90 had been constant for years. I found it very interesting that we always had about 90 one-on-one -on -one parents. And I thought, is there something in the water of Boston that determines that there are only 90 kids who need one-on-one -on -one parents? I don't think so. Now, it's expensive and it's very highly specialized. So we have to be very careful about this being part of the plan, but if your child as an individual education plan requiring a one-on-one -on -one para, we provide it. Um, we've reconfigured our ABA services and expanded them widely. So we ha now have, we actually are spending $2.5 million more this year on ABA services than we spent last year. $2.5 million more and we're not done yet. So when we would talk about ABA services last year, and I would tell you every month, we haven't figured it out yet. We don't know how we're gonna do this. Well, we know a lot more about how to do this now, and it costs a lot of money. Um, 
and the district is spending that money. Um, we now have, Le Lorraine is one of our supervisors, she's a master's level BCBA, so we have three master's level BCBAs who work in, out of my office. We have an administrator in Seth Bartholomew who's a master's level BCBA, and we have a cadre of, I think, 15 or 16 uh, of the best ABA specialists. And we have contracts with four major best providers in the Eastern Massachusetts area. May Institute, RCS, ABLES, and NEC, New England Center for Children, are now on contract to us. They're delivering direct services to children, and in the case of the Kilmer and the Higginson Lewis, we're trying to build what's called all-day ABA programming in our schools for the first time. So that the staff of the school will all be trained, and children will have the benefit of ABA services throughout the day. Um, we are going to have to expand, so I don't know whether you saw the Globe article today, but the number of children identified on the autism spectrum is up 78% since the year 2000. 78% since the year 2000. The number of children who are three and four years old identified in Boston in, one, in the last year identified with autism is up by 70% in one year. So we now have 126 three and four year olds who were not identified a year ago, who are now identified as students with, this, with autism. That's very good news for those children and families because if we, the evidence and research is, if we start intervening in a powerful way, getting kids services when they're three years old, the chances that they're gonna do well in school and grow up healthy and happy is greatly increased. So if we're identifying children on the autism spectrum when they're three years old and four years old, we're gonna do a better job with them. So that's really good news. But you can imagine, if that increases by 70% again next year, um, our, the numbers of kids in the early childhood program is gonna to continue to grow. Um, uh, and we are very close to figuring out, because of work that we did with the Lion School this past summer, uh, over the summer and into the school year, we're very close to figuring out how to budget inclusive schools so that inclusive schools will be able to get the funding they need to do the job they have to do. We've never figured that out in this district before. Um, so th those are accomplishments that we've made this year. Now, you could ask yourself, um, uh, well, well, so what's left to do? <laughs> uh, I'd have to go on for another couple of hours with all the things we haven't accomplished yet. So I know that you're, you're probably dealing with some issues in the life of your child that we haven't figured out yet. We will. One of the ways we do that, I explained to the family I met with today, was we, we try to solve problems around individual families. So we, we work with individual families about individual kids to fix what's going wrong and then we learn a lesson from having done that. So we learn something as a department every time we work on an individual case. So if you have an individual child where things are not going the way they ought to go, then make sure you fill out one of those forms because that becomes part of the problem solving and it becomes part of the education of the of the department and the, and the school district. It's very important. Um, let me stop because I have an 8 o'clock meeting to go to, but I wanted to make sure that you have a chance to ask questions. Yeah. Um, you mentioned there's an increased number of uh, schools in the inclusion network, uh, and uh, that um, not all of them are uh, fully inclusive. Right. Um, are any of them? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How many parents are here from the Henderson? Okay, the Henderson is a fully inclusive school. How about the Lion? Lion's a fully inclusive school. I'd say those are probably the only truly fully inclusive school 
in the district. Now, there are a number of schools, the Manning, the Mendel, um, the Harbor, uh, Haley, where the school is well, well on its way to figuring out how they're going to become a fully inclusive school. They're just not there yet. Some, most of the development happens gradually. It's very difficult to do it overnight. And if you talk to the people at the Henderson and the Lion, you'll, they'll tell you the story of the many years leading up to becoming fully inclusive. It's not, if you do it, you do it well, it doesn't happen overnight. And there is a really strong commitment. I think this came from the SPED PAC uh, that we're, we're not going to do inclusion poorly. Uh, it, I think I said one of these times that inclusion for inclusion's sake is no good at all. It, it has to be effective. And making inclusion effective for your child is different from making it effective for another kid, and so it becomes very complicated. Uh, some schools are doing a really good job of specializing. So there are a couple of schools, like the Manning, that is specialized in emotional impairment, or the Mendel that is going to be specializing in learning disability, where they focus all of their efforts on a particular population of kids, and they, they do all their professional development, and they, they get consultants, and they, you know. So now, but some schools like the Henderson, there are many different kinds of kids who go to the Henderson. Not all different kinds of kids, but many different kinds of kids go to the Henderson. I did want to make sure that I introduced another member of my staff. Natalie Ake is here. Natalie is, uh, is one of our new supervisors. She's a former uh, school-based coordinator, and she's a, a parent of a child with disabilities. And she, I, in my knowledge, she's the first new administrator of special education in Boston who is herself the parent of a child with disabilities. Um, so, welcome here tonight, Natalie. Um, it's nice to see you. Um, that, that's, a, that should, that's a signal to all of us that the expertise uh, in this field uh, is sometimes the expertise of parents. Um, and and um, that's going to be a, as I think about the future of special ed in Boston, I think that's something we have to be really willing to take on in a serious way. Um, other questions or comments? Yeah. John, you said 22 schools? 20. 20? The list you passed out at the December Fed Pack meeting had 15 on it. Yeah, there are a few five, more. Five yeah. more. Okay. Is there any easy way to find out what those schools are? Yeah. Um, well, are they on the website? Everything's so easy in this school district, right? Um, no, don't go to the website. There is going to be a new, however, there's a new, newly developed Boston Inclusive Schools Network website. And I, it's, I'm going to be meeting with the man tonight who's responsible for that development. Uh, it, it, and I'll, I'll, may, I'll ask him when is it going to be ready to be launched. And that would give you up to the minute information. Um, we have three national experts in inclusion who are our consultants, spend time every month in the schools. Um, there are uh, video vignettes on, the web, on, that web, on the new website. Um, it's all being supported by Education Development Center. I don't know whether anybody's ever heard of that, but it's a really wonderful organization based in Waltham, which is providing us with a lot of technical assistance. They have a great website, it's called edc.org, and uh, you can go on there and see uh, a lot of things about the support that's being provided there. I'm feeling the hook. Um, any any uh, other, okay. Uh, once again, thanks so much for being here tonight. It's, uh, it is, it's been a great year, we've got a couple of more months, but I really appreciate it. I appreciate your telling me when things aren't going right, and supporting what we're trying to do when we need that support. That's been really critical. So it's good seeing you all. Thank you.